Welcome to Beyond the Red Carpet today. I am very happy to introduce to you one of the original Osmond Brothers from the Osmond Brothers Quartet, Jay Osmond. Welcome, Jay. Thank you for Thank joining you, us. Fran Thank you, Francine. How are you? Well, I'm doing well, but you know what? I heard you had a little bit of a health scare recently. Oh, well, I couldn't believe it. It was like... Uh, I was, you know, I was lifting some boxes up the stairs, okay, and and I thought, oh, this is nothing, and but I, I noticed that they be, they became heavier and heavier as I was lifting, and I thought oh, I can still do this, and I pushed my blood pressure over two hundred, and and I I don't know what happened, and so and my my wife Karen said you better sit down, and so and I says well I, I'm okay, and I kept going, and then I got really dizzy. So she ordered. Uh, she called the, for the ambulance, and the, and they uh, rushed me in. The guy says, "I'm amazed you didn't have a stroke," and uh, but they called it a TA, I think TIA, uh -huh. something yeah. like that. But it 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 really scared me. So uh, so yeah. I'm, I'm on these blood pressure medicines, unfortunately. <laughs> well, at our age, we have to really kind of watch it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, you you think you're younger than you are, and. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of youth, <laughs> that we all, <laughs> we all, you started, were you four years old when you started on the Eddie Williams show? I was actually six years old. Uh, I was five, well, I, I was six years old when, when Walt Disney discovered us mm -hmm. at Disneyland. And then he was like our mentor and he taught us a, a few numbers and we he put us on the streets of Disneyland. And then he put us on some uh, two or three of his, uh, well, Wonderful World of Disney shows, and then uh, and when I was the end of about almost seven, that's when Andy Williams discovered us, and then I was uh, uh, almost seven on his show. Yeah, and you started uh, drumming at age eight. Eight, that's right. Well, actually, before that, my <clears throat> I would uh, sit by my mother's legs and. She'd give me pans and spoons, and I'd bang all as hard as I could. And she she would like encourage me. Uh, I'm I'm sure I was about four or five, and she says, "Oh, you are such a drummer, Jay. You are such a drummer." And the more she said it, the louder I would beat on those pans. <laughs> so she said, "You're my drummer." And so when when it came time for for us to learn ans instruments on the Andy Williams show, of course, guess who? who chose the drums so that was yeah. well, I used to take my I should have brought my drumsticks now I used to go around the house with my drumsticks doing it on everything and, <laughs> yeah, fun. so how many yeah I, I know your whole family is musically talented how many instruments do you play you know that's a, a that's an interesting question because every week we had to do something different like on the Andy Williams show they uh we had to learn to play xylophone one week and then banjos one week and then saxophones and then, and then pianos and then uh, different percussion instruments and then the trombone and then the tuba and then the clarinet. And then, so it would, every week would be something different. So I play a little bit of a lot of things, but not great, except for drums. I love drums. Drums has been my whole life and saxophone. My mother started us uh, saxophones on saxophones. That was actually our first instrument. Even before we, you know, in in the, in in our religion, we have this uh, program called Family Home Evening, and every every week we'd learn something and, and do something musically, and that's really where we actually got uh, our musical talents is from Family Home Evening, and so it was really uh, a blessing to us because we were already prepped as kids for what was to come, right? Musically, you know. Well, I think I know uh, all your fans probably remember their whole family standing in a line playing your saxophones. And, yes. Yeah. But, you know, going back to your drums, in the 1970s, and I remember this, you were voted one of the top drummers in the country. Well, thank you. Thank you remember you. being at the top? I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, were, you, you, were you asked by other groups to, to play on their albums and... Well, what was really interesting, and thank you uh, for remembering, I was, uh, they did a, a, a the, this magazine, uh, did a survey of the different drummers, and, and it was, I was in the top five, and I, and um, uh, yeah, I think it was Flip Magazine, yes, it was Flip Magazine, and uh, they did a, a survey of the top drummers that were, that were, uh, that did a lot of the playing, and, and uh, the, the other 
two drummers that were in there at the top five was were my mentors, uh, Jimmy Gordon, who was uh, who who played with uh, George Harrison and did the song Imagine for John Lennon. He he was really my first drum teacher, and and he went on tour with us. And then Ronnie Tutt was uh, was in the in the top five with me, and and he was my second drum teacher. He's of course Elvis's drummer, and oh, he and I he was fantastic. And, and, and so um, that's how we we kind of got to know Elvis is uh, and uh, and then of course he was with Neil Diamond and also uh, and with us uh, uh, Ronnie Tutt. And so, but it was really something we my, the f- most fun time I think in my drumming. Uh, uh, experience was we were doing this LA dance. They, they call it the LA street dance. And um, in the, uh, the headliner, there was, there was us, there was the group called war. And then there was the, uh, I think the spinners. And then um, I haven't sakes. Uh, uh, it was, it was, and then Chuck Berry was the uh, uh, headliner. And so it, so he he found out of course I had played uh, behind uh, a few drummer a few bands uh, I, again I'm, I'm losing my mind but when with Herb, Herb Albert he heard me play with Herb Albert and and he says I heard you play and I want you to uh, um, uh, our drummer didn't show up because the you know it was so crowded it was. Uh, that you couldn't get into this venue. It was like downtown Los Angeles and everybody was just thousands of people. And we were there, we were, we were going on before him, before Chuck, we were the group that was going on before Chuck Berry. And he said, our drummer didn't show up. I've heard you play with Herb Albert. Can you play Johnny? Be good. I'm like, are you kidding? This is, this is one of my favorite songs and I'll never forget that experience. And he turned around and, and then of course he was on the Donnie and Marie show too. And that's where I got to know him a little bit there. And, and he says, ready? One, two, da, 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 da. And, I, you know, and I'll never forget him looking at and giving the count off to me and playing Johnny be good. And, and that, that's a memory that's been lo- uh, lodged in my mind forever. Uh, that was one of my most fun drumming experiences. And the other one was, was in back in 72 and about, 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 I said, about a year ago, I got a message from, from uh, Deborah Bonham, who was John Bonham's sister. And she, and I, and, and she says, Oh, by the way, uh, Robert Plant wants you to know that he remembers how fun that was when you came up on stage. And I'm going, are, are you kidding? I, I got this coolest mem. Uh, and, and I says, will you tell him that was one of the happiest memories? And here's the memory. Okay. Um, Led Zeppelin was playing this place called Earl's court in England. And uh, the Claire brothers system, there's the sound systems that used to be the big ones that played in. I mean, that, that was everybody's sounds equipment. We used Claire brothers sound equipment, the Led Zeppelin. We used them. Uh, the Beach Boys, everybody used their systems. And so we were going to play Earl's Court the day after uh, Led Zeppelin. And so the, uh, uh, they called us. They says, hey, we've got tickets over for uh, here at the uh, Earl's Court to, for Led Zeppelin. You want to come over? And we thought, oh, are you kidding? Because we're big Led Zeppelin fans. And, and of course, they, they weren't our audience at that time because you know, our audiences were the young girls and, and screaming and and theirs was the, the, the you know, was the heavy rock metal kind of thing. But we went over there, you know, and we went backstage to meet them, and they were, like, really cool. And, and that's where I got to meet Robert, uh, uh, Robert Plant and also John Bonham. And he, he went, took me backstage and, 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 sh- and showed me his, his drum set. And then we, just the nicest guy. And, and his, his sister, Deborah, was, was uh, an Osmond fan. And uh, and so anyway, this, it's a long story. But anyway, we were talking and, and Robert said, hey, Osmonds, do you want to come up on stage with us? You know, and I'm going, we were all saying, well, you know, they're not our audience, right? You know, this is not our audience. <clears throat> and and they, uh, they and, and we says, we'd love to. He says, oh, it's just so easy. We've got all kinds of percussion instruments up there. There's congas, there's there's the, the tampering, you know, whatever. So. Uh, I'll never forget. We were behind the stage, and they were just about to do "Stairway to Heaven." And he's, "Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to meet my new friends." 
<laughs> you're going to love him. The Osmonds, and, you know, went up. And, and it was like nobody. I mean, you didn't hear anything in response. They just like, uh, uh, like, like, oh, yeah. And so we come up on stage and and I've never seen anything crazier in my life because, you know, we would go up on stage. It was kind of quiet. We get up there. Hi, thank you. Thank you. And, and John Bonham was right next to me. And he and, uh, and, he, and I got on the congas. He says, just follow and I says, I got gotcha. you. And and when they started Stairway to Heaven, I played Stairway to Heaven uh, on the congas next to him. And and uh, and I saw an amazing drummer. Uh, that was amazing. But but when when the music started, so when we used to start, the flash flashes would go crazy, the screams. But all I saw was hair everywhere. I mean, hair was flying everywhere, and it was and the. Uh, our system, Claire Brothers said that we were actually louder back in those days than Led Zeppelin because they had to, to crank the, the uh, sound higher over the screams because they, they, they didn't have screaming in their audience. It was just their instruments that made them loud. But they, they, they said that we, had the, that we were the loudest system back in the 70s. And it's because we had to get over the screaming stuff, you know. So that was a happy drum moment for me, even though it was on the congas, but I, I loved it. It's a good, it's a good memory. Uh, but speaking of all the, the screams and the fans, um, a couple of questions on that. I know you love dating before you no. <laughs> <laughs> ever. Well, did it ever dawn on you that do, do people want to meet you or date you because you are Jay or because you were Jay Osmond? Did that, was that a, was that a hardship when you were young growing up in the, uh, in the spotlight? You know, I had the, I had that question. Uh, I, I questioned it a few times when I was dating, I was actually looking really hard to find my wife, Karen, but I was, uh, I knew she was out there, but I, I, I did date. I did. It started to be, it was, it was fun for a while. <clears throat> and, and of course, I I I, uh, I just love to have a great time, and and uh, I felt that uh, because I didn't have a normal uh, experience in high school, and I, I didn't go through all the uh, all the things that uh, you know you go through the different in the prom and the, all this stuff. I thought I'm gonna I want to make up for um, <clears throat> things that I missed out. So I dated a lot. I wanted to just go have fun, and. There was a time in my life when I thought, you know, uh, I'm wondering, do, do they like me because of me or because of the, like you said, the the name or the whatever. But but time, I figured that time tells that. Time will will resolve that. Well, and me, that uh, so so frustrating to to wonder if somebody's really interested in me or in my name. Or but you, you know, when, when you when you date, and, and the, the reason you date is to find someone, uh, find the kind of qualities that that are that are make a good match for you, and it's all about the match. Like <clears throat> I was telling my wife and uh, the other day, you know, it's the importance I think of dating is is to get to know. It helps you to understand who you are. So when you date, what things do you like? To, what kind of qualities that are you looking for and are you are you up to that those type of qualities and so uh i i knew one thing one thing my, my father uh i'm going to tell you something that probably is very very special uh but I, I feel it's okay um i hope it's okay with my wife <laughs> um, <clears throat> um many years ago before uh uh oh this is back in 18 19 80 something about 1980 um <clears throat> my father came downstairs and he knew i was dating a lot of girls and and uh and but i just couldn't find the match i couldn't find the, the one and, and he says he came down uh it was about three in the morning <clears throat> and he says and he he was sweating and uh and he says jay wake up wake up this is like three in the morning and he says i saw your wife I hope it's okay if I'm telling this. <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> my wife's saying over here. And anyway, uh, she, and, and I says, really? What did she look like? She says, she's this beautiful little brunette. And she she was really smart, like like Olive, which is mother mother. She, like Olive, she she was really cute. She was really fun to be with. She loves the Lord and she loves you. 
And I go, wow. And I wrote those five things down. Okay. And I go, that is so cool. But after, and then you just, you know, I've never seen father like that. And then, so uh, with time passing by and I realized, I thought, well, it was just a wonderful father having hope for his son that, you know, so, uh, and I kind of forgot about it. And I just thought it was just a great thought. It wasn't anything. So, so when I, when I got divorced, I, um, uh, I realized that I thought about father's um, message, you know, and to me. And, and I thought, I know she's out there. I know she's out there. Or she's still out there. And so <clears throat> I get a little emotional when I talk about it. So, um, and sure enough, in uh, uh, 2014, I met this little brunette who's smart as a whip and cute and she's fun and loves the Lord and loves me. And that's my little Karen. So she's right there by you. Can she sit in and say hi to everybody? I want you to say, come here, sweetie. Come on, Karen. The, this is this. I call her Karina. That's her hi. Viking name. That's, that's her Viking name. How are you, Francine? Good to meet you. Fine. Uh, we are almost neighbors in Arizona, so we will all get together one of these days. But <laughs> great. We we're having a great time up here in Huntsville. In fact, uh, I wanted to meet someone else uh, that that came over to say hi to us. And this, her name is Linda Neely, and she was my as assistant for years. And she just came and popped in. I hadn't seen her for years. Come here, Linda. Let's just come say hi. This is Linda. She's over here. Hi. She, <laughs> she, she uh, has every story on me there is, I think. <laughs> I need to find out. I'll contact you. <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> nice to meet you. We're having lunch over here. And in, in, in we just, it's been a wonderful day. We're in Huntsville going and having all these memories. Well, okay, uh, memories. You uh, have book that you wrote many years ago called stages, yeah. stages and right your life and actually i was i when i when i talked to you one time i said you need to write a sequel because that ended a while ago and you you've had a whole bunch of um things happen to you since you ended your book but instead of doing that you wrote a musical okay can you tell us how that came to be and tell us about the musical that's coming up I'm glad you brought that up, Francine, because um, I was when I finished my book stages. OK, I, I felt that it wasn't my total voice. It, it, I was kind of I had people trying to help me put it together and I wanted to do it one way and they said to do it another way. And I wasn't really I mean, even though it's all the stories are true and I wanted to go deeper with it. Okay, it wasn't, it was more surfacey stories about my life. When I wrote it, that's what I said. And then you, you told me that I hit a, the nail on the head with that because you were just kind of slid over the surface of things. And I think everybody wants to know the nitty gritty and not, not necessarily the dirty, but just more involved in, in your lives. And I think it was your review that really made me think, uh, of the review of my book, that really made me think about telling my story. And so uh, I was in the process in St. George with my wife where she bought me these two because when I first put my book together, I did it all by three by five cards and I put them all on the floor and I would walk my story and I'd put and be shifting stories and each story he had a little three by five card and I'd walk and I'd take a left and it was all over the floor. And so that's how I put my book together. But uh, I was putting this new book together called Finding My Voice. Okay, now this is interesting to, to me because Karen brought these two whiteboards and she had me, uh, and as I, would, she, as I would talk, she would write this down. Like, here's, here's my life. And we'd write these things. And this is what's important to me. And, and things started coming out that, that were not in the book stages about my feelings about things rather than just telling a story This my you know, like this same kind of thought that you had that you said, you need to go deeper with this. And so I was, and now, now I went deeper and deeper. And, and so we're right in the process of find, uh, finding my voice. When one morning I, 
we, of course, we, we, uh, we, in our morning prayer, uh, she says our morning family prayer, I say the closing one, we both got this very powerful feeling. And, and uh, we had, I had already moved Karen about four times by this time in our marriage. And, and, and it says, uh, you need to move to England. Okay. We're right in the, again, we're right in the process of writing this book in St. George. And, and I got the strong feeling moved to England and she, in which I did not know she had the same feeling. You need to move to England. And at lunch I said, okay, uh, sweetheart, I got to tell you. And, and I, th- you're going to think I'm crazy, but I, I feel we need to move to England and she goes, thank you. <laughs> I've been trying to tell you that all day. So we didn't know why. We just knew that we were in the process of writing this book. That's all we, and why would we move to England? So in a month, uh, and, and, you know, and you, you know how it takes time to move. And so the next day, my nephew calls and says, I'm looking for a place to, to rent. Can, do you know of any place? Because we needed to rent out our house, right? Things just fall, fell in line in order so quickly. And in, in, in a month, we were in England. Now, we yeah. find ourselves... The thing is, when it's meant to be, things just do domino fall in line. And Absolutely. That's exactly what happens. That's why we know that the, the, this, uh, the Lord is behind us because things were just happening. And, we, and then we were in England wondering why we're there, right? And we get a call from my good buddy, Jimmy, uh, Billy, Billy Dean. And he says, hey, come to Sweden with me because I want you to meet some wonderful people that are great. You know, Robert and Marie Wells, they're very big stars in the, in the Scandinavia. So we could fly to Sweden. And now we, we're in Sweden, and, and, and they said, we want you to meet one of the biggest producers. And he's, he's a, such an Osmond fan, and he's, he owns all these theaters. And he, he just really would like to meet you when you're in Sweden, okay? So we go up to meet his, uh, his name is Bosa Anderson, one of the coolest guys on the planet. And anyway, he comes up to me, and, and he says, I've been a fan all my life. And he says, I have wanted to do... A, 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 a stage play, a, a theatrical, a musical about your family. And I says, you know what I've always wanted to do? Uh, I've always wanted to do a story. In fact, I'm writing my story right now called Finding My Voice. And he says, why don't you do a living memoir of your voice instead of writing a book? Why don't you put it on stage? Because I told him about stages, how that was the different stages I'm in and the different stages I performed on. That's why stages is the name. So the finding my voice evolved or morphed into a musical. Yes. yes. This, this big board that, that we felt inspired uh, or, or Karen felt inspired to get me and, and in St. George, now we're finding, and now we know why we're in England. Now we know. And, and it started the, at, in, in this little place in Stockholm called Engelen. And, and, and this book that I was writing is now morphed into the musical, uh, Finding My Voice. And, and this is about the, it's, it's a musical about my family, about my perception, my view on, on what happened or what, it, when all the things that went on. And, and when I produced the movie called uh, Side by Side, uh, with my mother, I, I wanted to do it just exactly as she saw it. Okay. That is from her side. And, and I wanted to honor that. And I told the family, cause they were a little bit critical of me. They says, why didn't you put in the things that were really difficult from there? They each had their own view on it. I says, because it wasn't your story. It wasn't mine. It was mother's. This is side by side. The, the, the movie on the TV movie was mother's view of it. So they each want, had a different view. And so I, this musical and they, my family, was, you know, they all kind of wanted input. And I says, I'm sorry, but this is my view. This is going to be my view of what I went through. Not yours, not yours, but mine. And so that's why it, that's why I wanted to do it my own on myself by myself. And, uh, and so this, the, 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 the theatrical play, will be from my view from, and there's going to, it's a two hour play, half of it's music, half of it's dialogue. And boy, you talk about difficult putting 
an hour's worth of how many years in show business in into dial. And what really made me think that's going to work is because when we did the workshop for this, uh, we Andrew Lloyd Webber's uh, producers are producing mine, and uh, and they they even they invited all these uh, theater owners, producers, directors, choreographers to the workshop, and and oh gosh, it was really uh, nerve wracking because now you'll see if it's going to work or not, right? And when we got and, and all the best actors from from West End, uh, the lady who played Lay. It, maybe who's who played the uh, the good witch on the on Wicked played Marie. Uh, uh, Wayne was from uh, Jersey Boys. He Wayne was fantastic, and then Meryl was from Les Mis. Anyway, and so we got all the the top uh, actors to come in, and, and oh, they did a wonderful job. But to see the these people who are real critics in the in the theater industry stand up at the right moment, cry at the right moment laugh at the right time. I'm sure everybody here wants to know when will it come to the U.S.? Cross your fingers, say your prayers, because I hope it comes here. I'd love it to come to the United States. You are one of the most down-to-earth performers. <laughs> so easy to be with. I mean, you don't have an ego. And that's one of the things that I thought was really cool, because I've been doing, doing my job for 20 something years and I come up with these uh celebrities who are just their heads are up in the cloud how do you stay grounded besides Karen anyone who's kind of sounded big headish or ego it's just insecurities basically that they have and so I I think when you really I think a lot of it really was the training of my parents and and also our belief uh, uh in the gospel and and, and knowing that what's really important in that, and I really believe that we're all children of God and we're all down here to help each other. And, and it doesn't matter whether you are uh, uh, in show business or whether you are in education or in fact, what I'm reason I'm, what I'm doing right now is because I'm, I'm working at this juniors. Uh, I'm, I'm the assistant principal at the, uh, American Leadership Academy in Ironwood in Arizona. And the reason why I wanted to do that, and I'm over the fine arts program, is because I really think that helping kids is really what I just love to do the most and see when, see how you can change lives at that age, especially the junior high school era um, age and, and help them find direction in their life. And, and when you have direction in your life, you're really happy. And a lot of the kids are confused these days in the media or the world shifts them back and forth and, and they, they don't have the grounding I think that they need sometimes. And so I want to spend the rest of my life uh, trying to help kids be grounded. And I think that's important and, and help them understand what faith in the Lord is all about. What, how do you have that? How do you develop that? And that the faith is really what I think brings peace in your life. And so I just, that's what I, I want to do spend the rest of my life. And I wanted to write this, this uh, play, this um, musical to do that and, and to help people understand how, how hard it really was at times, because in they, when you think of the Osmonds, they think of a lot of the, they don't hear all the, like you said, the nitty gritty stories. They don't hear the, how hard it was and the things that we sacrificed for and, and, and the situations that, that we we're up against and, and the, some of the temptation things that we we're up against and the hard things. And I wanted to put that into play. I wanted to try to help people understand that it was not easy being an Osmond. It was very difficult. Well, but you made it with flying colors and uh, we have a zillion soundtracks to or, or CDs to remember you guys by. And unfortunately, we are out of time. And also, oh, yeah. you have retired from the entertainment business being on stage. Yeah. One of these days, we will have you back and you will do a drum solo for us. I will. I would love to do that. And I, I, I have a great respect for you, Francine, and your, your background and your writing ability. Oh. It's just, you're amazing. So it's nice to talk to you. Love your family. Jason is adorable. I mean, your son and uh, oh, yeah, he's cool. I mean, all my kids are cool. <laughs> thank you. Good talking with you. Thank you so much. And for the viewers, Jay Osman, we'll see thank you next you. time. We take another trip beyond the red carpet.